Hi, I'm Michael Jones. I'm one of the pastor teachers at the Orange View Church of Christ in Orange County, California. We're continuing to go through the COVID-19 coronavirus event, almost a month into it at this point. The government here has requested that everyone for our own safety uh, practice social distancing. So keeping with that guidance, I'm broadcasting from isolated locations as I do our daily devotionals. And today I'm broadcasting from Tantooine. So there hadn't been anybody here for a long time, so it's a rather remote location. Thought it'd be a good choice. Today, as we spend time in the scripture, I'm going to go back to the Jewish scriptures and take a look at Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. It says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continuously. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. One reality is that oftentimes what it is that we want and what it is that God wants do not match. We very frequently desire wealth and notoriety and popularity, things. The Apostle John refers to this as being the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. These, he says, is of the world and not of the Lord. In the account of Noah and the flood here in Genesis chapter 6, we see that same dichotomy. The world wants one thing and God wants another. Very rarely do the two match up. In this instance, in Genesis 6 and following, the cares of the people and the selfishness of men had reached catastrophic levels. In verse 11 of chapter 6, it says, The earth was corrupt in the Lord's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. God looked down and saw the wickedness of man, and the imagination of his thoughts were only evil continuously. God was very saddened that man had become consumed with his wickedness, and the Lord says, was grieved. Men filled their minds with evil thoughts. And notice that the scriptures tell us precisely what God thinks about evil thoughts. In Proverbs 15, 26, it says, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. In Matthew 9 and verse 4, Jesus confronted his accusers and said, Why do you think evil in your heart? You know that our thought lives are very important. The way we think defines largely who we are. When we come to the Word of God to find guidance on managing our thought life, we find instruction that reminds us to think on things that are true and honest and pure and virtuous. That's Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. One way that we can facilitate that is to saturate our mind with the Word of God. In Joshua chapter 1, as the people were preparing to go into the promised land, the Lord gave this guidance, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it. For then you will be prosperous, and then you will have good success. If we take the scriptures and spend time in the word of God, and allow that to retrain our thinking, one of the things that will enable us to do that is to contemplate what it is that God has already done. The scriptures largely contain a historical record of God's dealings with man, and in that we can see the great things that the Lord has done for his people. In Psalm 143 and verse 5, the psalmist said, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done, and I ponder the work of your hands. Certainly what it is we expose ourselves to should be uh, carefully observed as well. In Psalm 119 and verse 37, the psalmist says, Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Perhaps one of the most definitive passages on the need to get our thoughts under control is 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. The Apostle Paul there says, We destroy arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God, and then we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Well, the people of Noah's day, rather than taking their thoughts captive, were fully committed to sin. So God tells Noah, he's through. He's going to bring an end to it all. But Noah and his family will be spared if they're obedient to God's will. 
In verse 8, it says, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And then in verse 13, God said to Noah, I've determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you'll make it. The length of the ark will be 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, its height 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. Well, Noah listens to God. He builds the ark, and God honors that work by closing the door. In chapter 7 and verse 16, Noah and his family entered into the ark. Male and female of all flesh went in the ark as God had commanded them, and the Lord shut the door. God is there at the end, sealing the deal. Being faithful means getting an opportunity to witness the power of God, the deliverance of God, the blessings of God. As we look at the account of Noah and the ark, there are plenty of images of Christ in the ark, symbolism that's designed to point to the Lord. Perhaps the most significant of all is the symbolism connected with the door. Please notice that there was one door in the side of the ark. There was one way to safety and rest. Christ is the only way to safety and to rest in heaven. In John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. A few chapters earlier in John 10, Jesus directly said he was the door. But in my thinking, maybe the most significant thing about God and salvation and the door is who it is that shut the door. Back in verse 16 again of Genesis 7, it says that they went into the ark as God commanded them, and then this, and the Lord shut the door. Your opportunity for salvation ends when the Lord says it ends. It is not your choice. It is God's choice. There is no promise of tomorrow. That's why the scriptures say, today is the day of salvation. When I was a child, I used to watch the TV program, Batman, that real cheesy one. And in that one, there was a time once where the Riddler gave Batman a riddle. I'm a man of few words, but a man of many riddles. So riddle me this. What is it that is always coming, but never arrives? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. But when it arrives, it is today. Don't put off your obedience and submission to God until tomorrow. That day never comes. Today is the day of your salvation. Well, I'll tell you, when our desires and ambitions are not guided by God's will and His goals, the results are always bad. We might wonder how we got in a situation that's not going well, but it probably happened like this. You replaced God's will with your own. But I do have good news for you. Take a look with me at Psalm 37 and verse 4. The psalmist there says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. A lot of people totally corrupt this passage to teach that God will give you whatever you want. But look at it again. It's not that God gives you whatever you want. It's that God gives you the wants themselves. The desires of your heart themselves come from the Lord. And as they do, you'll find your life taking on an altogether different direction. As you walk with the Lord today, I want you to think about how good God has already been to you, the blessings that you have enjoyed personally. Think about the great things that God has done to righteous people throughout the ages. Delight yourself in the Lord. And then notice how your wants and desires change from those of the world to those of the Lord. Well, I hope that's helpful for you. I'll be back again tomorrow from another isolated location to spend time in the Word with you. Thanks a bunch.